love the char this character in the Bible. I love the story, uh, the stories that surround Elijah. And so we've been talking about Elijah the Tishbite and come to this chapter. And I know I've preached messages before where I've referenced this and I'm going to mention it here again. So uh, today we're going to go right back through. I know he already read it, but we're going to go back through that a little bit at a time and look at all the events that happened. So you're in uh, 19. Let's start this again. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he, with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. You see, Elijah hits this really low point, this really like depressed state. And that's what I've preached about before and mentioned, and I brought him up when it comes to this, because it seems so strange that we've been reading about our hero, and we just left off chapter 18. You know, he's, he's boldly taken on all the prophets, and he's all by himself, but he's, but he's going there, and, and, and the fact... The Lord, you know, proves himself and the Lord calls down fire and uh, consumes the sacrifice, you know, that's been doused with water and, and just nobody would have ever expected it. So he's had a great victory in his life, great spiritual victory. He's done great things for the Lord and he's just on the top. I mean, just everything's going great. And in the next chapter, what makes the difference? Apparently, he's not afraid of Ahab, but apparently he's afraid of his wife, <laughs> okay, uh, Jezebel. And uh, this was enough, just the fact that Jezebel's after him and says, that's it, tomorrow you're going to be dead. And he flees for his life, and he's where he's telling God, yeah, I'm done. This is it. I've done everything I can do. Uh, I'm not better than my father's. I've, I've, uh, uh, I've, I just, it'd be better if I just die. And uh, I can honestly say, I don't think I've ever been to a point in my life where I was like, you know, I'd rather just die right now. I just haven't. Maybe maybe the things have just been too good for me in my life, but I've never felt that way. But I've known people that have. I've known people that, you know, have get hit in depression. And uh, obviously there's some medication, by the way, if you ever have any thoughts like that, uh, you know, so depressed that you're like suicidal or something like that, that's a big deal. And you need to talk to somebody about it. But, uh, you know, and don't think like, oh man, that's just, that person is just so unspiritual you know, that they would think that way. I've thought that way many times, but the truth of the matter is sometimes people's minds can be broken. Sometimes people's minds can be messed up. Sometimes it's from substance abuse or some kind of, unfortunately, even a prescribed medicine uh, can make somebody uh, feel that way. And, uh, you know, or sometimes it's just they've had a rough time. You know, I've never been through the amount of persecution Elijah's been through. Uh, but the thing is that I always bring up whenever I read this story is how it's interesting you know, you would think, man, that's going to make God mad. He did all those great works. He proved himself faithful. And then here you are running away and wanting to die. You think that God would get mad at him, but it doesn't look like he is. I don't see anywhere in this story where God's mad at him. He just, uh, in fact, we see that, what's he do? The first thing he does, he sends him an angel to comfort him. Verse 5 says, and he lay and slept under a juniper tree. Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, arise and eat. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, we find this other point that I've made up made before passages. The solution sometimes uh, to people in depression is just take a break, eat some, food, some water, get some sleep. Really, that sometimes just solves it. And then you wake up, you get back from your rest, and uh, you can begin afresh. So let's read that verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals. Hey, Amen. that put me in a good mood. Some cake and a uh, cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so he gets back on his feet. And, uh, and it's like all this time was just a, an away time to regenerate. You know? And this is why I feel like it's very important as a church uh, even to, uh, to have times where we get away. 
sometimes people call them retreats or, uh, you know, what they did in a, a group of guys that I associate with. They said, uh, men don't retreat, men recharge. And so they called it a men's recharge. And uh, so that's the idea that they, another, another group called it the men's advance. We want to advance. But let's be honest, sometimes we need to retreat <laughs> and we need to get away and we need to, you know, just have a time of relaxing and refreshing. Some of us like to get away, go into nature, go for a run, go on a hike. It's okay to do those things. Sometimes we need certain things to get away. Now, we don't want to just ignore all of our duties and get ourselves into a bigger mess because we're, you know, we're, we're, you know how whenever you're gone, work piles up on you, you know, on vacation or whatever. And so we don't want to do that, but we want to go ahead and have a time to refresh when we're actually at a point where, hey, I've just, uh, you know, I just don't think I can take it anymore. You can. You just need to wait. You know, you just need to be revived a little bit. And then uh, apparently he says, OK, this last time, eat some more because this journey is going to be a long journey. And he goes on a 40-day journey where he's, want, where he's going from one place to another. And I don't know what all he did on that journey, but apparently he had no food. You know, I'm assuming he drank whenever he could drink. Maybe he had a little uh, extra food with him. I don't know, but it says that he went in the strength of that meat that he, that he ate that day before, uh, 40 days. So he had a lot to do, but he had to, God had to, had to refresh him. God had to give him, you know, some time to, to heal. And then he said, no, you're, you're only doing this so that you can get up and you go back and hit that, that long journey. Anyway, I love that story, and I've made reference to that before. Uh, but I usually don't get into this part of the story, which is more where we're going to deal with this afternoon, which is the uh, God showing himself up. Okay, so after that 40-day journey, <clears throat> excuse me, after that 40-day journey, look at verse 9. And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the God, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And now look, Elijah has apparently, after that 40 days journey, fallen right back into like, you know, that was a long trip without food. <laughs> you know, so maybe he's fallen right back into that depression state again or something. I don't know. But here's what he says: I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, uh, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And uh, this is the part that I want you to notice. Okay, he has the op Elijah has this opportunity to see God work in a mighty way. Okay, but think uh, uh, about this story here. Behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rock before the Lord. I don't know if you've been in a storm. Like oftentimes here in Kansas, we, we, we're familiar with some kind of strong gust of wind, tornadoes especially. Uh, you know, it wouldn't want to live in a trailer park in, in some, some parts. Uh, I remember when we were in Oklahoma City, more Oklahoma, I think every year we were there, got hit by a tornado. And totally demolished the city, and then they'd have to rebuild, and then a tornado come through and knock it out. I'm like, move! <laughs> Why are you still living there? Right? Because it is devastating. I don't know if you drove through Joplin after that big tornado hit uh, hit Joplin, but man, it looked like a war zone. Totally destroyed everything. It was like, wow, that's powerful. It looks like a nuclear bomb went off in that area. <laughs> and so I don't know. You, you would say, okay, well, what is this strong wind that he was seeing? Well, I don't know, but it was causing rocks. It was renting the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks. You know, so he's standing there, he's looking out, and God allowed him to ha see this, this great gust of wind. You know, how it looked, I don't know how it sounded, but I can tell you this, you're all alone in the wilderness and looking out off of the t a mountain, and that big of a wind comes and rocks are falling. I'm going to tell you, his heart rate pump got pumping. <laughs> I bet you he was a little scared, and he saw the power and the glory of the Lord. In the, in, in the fear of the Lord at that time. But then it says this, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Now God sent the earthquake, but what it's saying is he didn't get anything. He didn't hear anything from God in that. He just kind of like had to experience that fear a little bit, but he didn't get an answer from God. He didn't get a, a, a voice from God. Verse 12, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now, again, I don't know if you've ever been in a house fire. I've, I've never been in a house fire. 
Uh, you know, and then I've never been in a place where like the whole, you know, like Colorado every year seems like they're catch on fire or California uh, or something. Uh, I can't imagine why God would send fire their way, but <laughs> mountains burning up and everything. And I'm talking, uh, I've never seen that, but I know this. Uh, I've told you the story before about how when I worked on a farm, that was a bad decision. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, and I used to burn trash. And one time I went to go do the chores while the trash was burning. And I hadn't really done a good job of making sure there was all the debris was out of the way. And the next thing you know, that fire started going outside of the ring and it started uh, getting some hay that I didn't realize was still on the ground and it started catch. And then there was a huge field fire and I'm like, Oh no, what have I done? And it's like heading towards the trees and then the trees are going to catch on fire. And then as the barn's going to catch on fire, what, what do I do? I don't want to call anybody. I don't want to call the fire department. So I'm running, you know, to get a bucket and I'm running back and whew, well, that didn't do anything. The fire just grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, long story short, I got it, I got it put out. <laughs> I, I won't, I'll save that illustri illustration for another day. But I remember thinking in my heart, just pounding, thinking that fire is out of control. And you don't have to be, once the fire gets big enough, I mean, you could be like from me to that door over there and you feel like you're in the fire. I mean, you're, you're getting hot. You're turning red like a sunburn. You know what I mean? It doesn't take long to see the power of God in a fire, you know, and I think it's interesting that hell is, is described as a fire. I mean, the lake of fire and uh, don't know exactly how that works. Okay. I realize talking about spiritual, we're talking about souls that burn in fire. Don't know how that works, but here's what I know. It's an illustration. It, it, I mean, if it's an illustration, you know, an illustration is a picture of something you know, that's, that's really bad. <laughs> okay. And when you're illustrating fire and that's an illustration of something really bad, look, I don't know hell. I mean, I just say it's fire because that's what the Bible calls it, but what, but I don't know how it works spiritually, like a soul in hell. I don't understand how that works. I hope you don't understand. I, I preached this one time and somebody said, Oh, he's doubting hell. No, I don't doubt hell. I believe hundred percent in hell, but I just don't understand how it works spiritually. You understand what I'm saying? But here's what I know as a human, you know, God has given us fire. And if you've ever touched a fire and burn, then the illustration of hell makes you think, boy, I sure wouldn't want to be burning in fire for all eternity. You see what I'm saying? Because you felt that how hot that fire is just to touch it for a second. And so God has a way of showing us in nature his power. And when you're faced with uh, the, the destructive nature of the fire, you're like, man, I'm afraid of God because God can send uh, you know, fire. God can send wind that will crush the mountains and the rocks and, and God can destroy in all these different ways. But Elijah saw the fire and guess what? No answer from God, no word from God. It was just a fire. You know, obviously it was from the hand of God, but there was no, no, uh, no answer. And, uh, and then it says, there was a still small voice. You know, he's not in the great wind. Oh, I forgot to mention the earthquake. Anybody ever been in an earthquake? All right. Scary, right? Yeah, you lived out that way <laughs> in uh, uh, Las Vegas and, and uh, California. If you're anywhere around there, you get some earthquakes. We were in Japan, and it seems like we mostly got, everyone always talked about the aftershocks. Like, that's what we usually got. But I'm telling you, those aftershocks, you could be sitting in a, on the highway and watch the traffic light just go... And I'm telling you, when the ground starts rumbling and, you know, I never saw like the ground open up or anything <laughs> like you see in the movies. But when that ground starts moving and you realize there's nothing I can do about it, there's just this hopeless feeling that you have of like, man, this is the power of God. You know, the other thing I always think about is the sea, because God uses that in the Bible a lot, too. Like, can you imagine being out in the middle of the sea and a storm comes and it's just like it's dark, it's stormy, the ship's going. You're like, if I go overboard, I'm dead. There's no way I can survive this, right? And all these things make me think like how small we are in this world and how helpless we are. No matter how strong you are, like you can't, you know, I've heard of like really good swimmers, you know, trying to jump in and try to rescue somebody who's drowning and they die. Right. Because sometimes the current or whatever is just, there's no way, it doesn't matter how good of a swimmer you are, you, you can't get it. And so, so God, you know, we realize the power of God just through his nature, just what he demonstrates to us on this, work, uh, on this earth. It should bring you to your knees because you, you realize his power. But here's the thing. 
it wasn't like God sent this big wind and said, Elijah, you know? It wasn't like God spoke to him in the fire. He didn't speak to him in the earthquake. It says he saw all those things and then a still small voice. And I've wondered that most of my life, like why the still small voice? Like what was he trying to show? Could he have spoken through the fire? Well, he spoke to Moses in a burning bush, right? Could he have spoken through the great wind? You know, could he have spoken through the earthquake? Of course he could have. But he wanted Elijah to hear a still small voice. And it was almost as if God's saying, look, I can get your attention however I choose to get your attention. <clears throat> but I'm choosing to speak to you in a small, calm, still voice. And I'm going to tell, tell you this. You'd much rather be spoken to by him in the still small voice than through the, de the destructive uh, power that he has the ability. Uh, and, and that should humble you. That should make you say, I want to be on God's side. I want to be humble and I want to be willing to respond to him in a moment's notice when I hear that still small voice. Now say what you want about the still small voice. Okay. Uh, I've, you know, people use it too flippantly. You know, like, well, God spoke to me. You know, anybody could tell you, well, God spoke to me. And what are you supposed to do now? All right. You're going to call them a liar. Well, it depends. Number one, if what they're saying contradicts what the Bible says, God didn't speak to them. Okay. Cause somebody, they heard some other voice or something because God isn't going to contradict himself. All right. So you get Joyce Meyer up here saying, well, I know what the Bible says, but God called me to be a pastor. I mean, she, she literally said that. Like, I know what the Bible said, but God called me to. Well, no, he didn't because it con it's contrary to what the Bible says. Okay. Yes. So, uh, so we never, he's never going to speak to you. And, and hey, man, there's deceiving spirits out there. There's false witnesses. There's even demons out there. You know, who's to say? I mean, this is why the Apostle Paul said, hey, even if an angel comes down and preaches another gospel, don't, don't believe him. Right. Because anybody, you know, we could be tricked by Satan's lies. And so you don't want to just be like, well, you don't understand. Like this, this thing happened in my life and, and I just know it was God. Well, not if it contradicts his word. That's for sure. Okay. And uh, the other thing is like when people come to you and say, well, God told me this. And you're like, well, he didn't tell me that. So what do I do? Like, do I call this person a liar? Uh, I remember in, uh, in Bible college, it was real common for these guys to be like, see that woman over there you know, I'm going to marry her one day. God showed me. And it's like, wait, did God tell her <laughs> that you're going to marry her? Because <laughs> that's a lot of pressure. Like, hey, you want to go on a date? God told me you're going to, you're going to be my, you know, you don't want that. Okay. So, uh, so God, but could God actually put into somebody's heart? Like, hey, you need to pursue that, that woman. That's going to be your future. I, I know for sure he could, you know, I don't want to get into details because it's no one's business, really. But I remember feeling that way about Valerie. Like, she's the one. <laughs> you know, God put that in my heart. Now, you know, you, what does that sound like? Because that's a question everybody wants to know. Uh, I remember I was nine years old and felt like the Lord had told me that I was going to be a preacher one day. Okay. Now, I know that sounds weird to some people. And it wasn't this audible voice. It wasn't. It was just actually, you know what it was? I was listening to preaching. I saw the man up there preaching. He was fervently preaching. He loved the word of God and he was preaching. And something in my heart was like, you know, I could do that. God, do you want me to do that? Hmm, I think he wants me to do that. Now, look, I don't know how that happens to you. I don't know how you communicate with God, but that's the exchange I had. That's the feeling that I had in my heart. And so I began to tell people, God called me to preach. And I remember kids older than me, you know, making fun of me, you know, oh, what did he sound like? So, you know, God talked to you. How does God talk to you? What does he sound like? And I'm like, you know, just if he talked to you, you would know. <laughs> but it's a still small voice. You know, you don't need some great signs, some signs and wonders and miracles. God will lead you to what he wants you to do. And, uh, and this is something that... Uh, you know, might be different for different people. Some people uh, don't think that he necessarily works that way anymore. I believe that he does. Okay. Uh, and obviously you want to know you, you, you want to know that you're in God's will. It's one of the most com uh, popular, qu <laughs> the most common question that I get probably. I was like, well, how do you know when you're in God's will? How do you know when you're doing what he wants you to do? And usually I say, look, if you're not hearing from me, you don't know what to do. Just just, you know, stay in God's word, 
keep praying and keep seeking his will, asking him for wisdom, and then just go about your business doing what you are currently doing. How do I know God wants me in this job? Well, you're still at that job, so just keep doing the best you can, you know what I mean, until he, until he moves you. But, uh, but when you know God's speaking to you, you know he's leading in your life, then he is, you know, probably. That's between you and him. Sometimes, uh, you know, people say that they're called to preach. Well, you know, how about, I already mentioned some people claiming that they're called to be a pastor. Well, if it contradicts God's word, then, you know, you have to stop and say, well, is it just my heart? Is there something in there where I want this to be God talking? Or is it actually something that he could be leading me to do? I mean, you have to search the Lord for that. I am not the voice of God to you. I mean, I guess God could use something that I say to speak to your heart, but God will speak to you in a still small voice many times. And you'd much rather that, like I said, than, than him to send down the fire or the wind or the earthquake. So for this message, though, the main points that I want to make from the rest of the sermon is what it is God tells Elijah in this still small voice. Because, you know, God is going to tell him a few things that is exactly what he needed to hear. Here's a guy again. He was, in chapter 18, our hero. He was laughing at the guys, you know, who, who were calling on the false gods and saying, hey, speak louder. Maybe your God can't hear you. Maybe he's sleeping. You know, maybe he's, uh, you know, just you got to get louder. Maybe he'll listen to you. And he's like making fun of him. And now he's running for his life and saying, hey, I want to. He seems like two different guys, right? Well, God's going to tell him something here. Look at 15, verse 15. Let's see, how far did I read? Oh, okay, look at verse 12 again. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in a mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him that said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because of the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. Sound familiar? This is his, uh, this is his plea. This is what he's, uh, you know, his complaint is. He said it in verse 10, and now he's saying it again. So here's the still small voice, all right? Verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Go. Return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. The first thing that God often will say to us in this situation is go, return. <laughs> that sounds contradictory, go or return, but you understand? Go back, go back. You know, so many times when we, when we want to hear from God, it's because we've kind of wandered off the course. We've kind of gone off the path and he reminds us, you know what? Here's what you need to do, go back. Go back to where you used to be. Go back to where you started. Back to that time when you had, you know, your that first love, like they talk about in Revelation, that first love. Go back, go back to that. We all get off course, you know, in our lives for all sorts of reasons. One source, uh, one reason we often will get off is backsliding. Okay, you're familiar with that term? That's actually a biblical term, uh, not typically used exactly the way that we use it. But let's go ahead and look at Jeremiah. That's really in significant part of the message, but I thought we'd look at this. Jeremiah 14. <clears throat> Jeremiah 14, verse 7. O oh Lord, now you got to realize, Jeremiah is crying out to the Lord. He's the weeping prophet, they call him, right? He wrote the book of Lamentations as well. And, uh, and he's crying out to the Lord because his people are going to go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years under great persecution. Great, A lot of them are going to die, uh, be slain with the sword. And he's, he's hearing all this, and it's really hard for him to hear. He doesn't want that, but he knows it's because of the sins of the people uh, that this is happening. He says, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us, do thou it for, for thy name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. O oh, the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof, in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be as a stranger in the land? 
and as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry uh, for a night. A lot of God's people try to use that on God. Like, God, you know, if, 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 if we have to go through that punishment, people are going to look at you and say, you're not as mighty of a God as, as they thought that you were, you know. And uh, this is why I love David, because David wasn't worried about that. David would just humble himself and say, you know what, I get what I get. And he would just get right with God, no matter how humiliating it was. But sometimes people were like, hey, do it for your own name's sake, God. Well, you don't want to be a laughing stock, you know, to the other nations or whatever. Verse 9, why shouldest thou be as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? Yet thou, O Lord, art in the midst of us, and why are called, uh, and, sorry, we are called by thy name, leave us not. Listen to this part. Thus saith the Lord unto his, this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquities and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for this people for their good. He's saying to Jeremiah, Don't pray for these people because they need to be punished. If they don't get punished, they're not going to learn from this. They're not going to do any good because they need that punishment to help them out of this. And so he had to watch his people suffer for 70 years. He had to watch, you know, Zedekiah's eyes get plucked out right after he watched his son slain before his very eyes. And, and, uh, and he watched a lot of the Israelites slain by the sword. And he watched them taken into captivity. Young men, Daniel and, and all those guys made eunuchs and brought before the king. I mean, it was a rough time. And God said, hey, you got to go through this. I'm going to tell you this. You much more want to respond to God's word when it's a still small voice than when he brings the fire. <laughs> you, know? you want to respond while it's still a small, loving, kind voice than whenever he brings the earthquakes and he brings the, the winds you know, that are going to destroy the rocks and the mountains. Okay, Communicate with God while he's still a still small voice, if that makes sense to you. All right, sometimes that's how we get off course because we simply backslide into sin. Our own desires, our own flesh, that's normal, that's common, uh, that, that happens regularly. The, but the Bible says in Proverbs 24, But the wicked shall fall into mischief. You see the difference? You know, one guy, he's fallen seven times, but each time he gets back up and says, oh man, I got to get back on the right course. I got to get re back right with the Lord. The other man, he falls in the mischief, right? Because he's wicked and he just doesn't ever come back until, and, and so God's going to have to get a hold of him in a different way than the, uh, the righteous, than the just man. Sometimes the person didn't necessarily do anything wrong, didn't backslide. I mean, none of us are perfect. We all, we all sin. But as far as backsliding and turning on God and doing something that would require that, uh, that specific type of judgment, uh, sometimes that's not what happens. Sometimes just a tragedy in your life happened. You know, I just recently had somebody ask on Facebook, you know, when tragedies happen, it's that old question that everyone's asked, why do bad things happen to good people? You know, and it was like, you know, does God ordain these things to happen? Is it just like he wants to bring about pain and suffering in someone's life? I mean, is it to show me that I did something wrong or whatever? And look, it could be all manner of reasons. Sometimes it's not God at all. Read James 1. God can't be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. Uh, it's, it's not God who just wants to bring bad things in your life, okay? Sometimes you just bring bad things in your life yourself. <laughs> Sometimes uh, a wicked person brings bad things into your life. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, there's all different reasons why bad things can happen to us. But here's the question, you know, how, what do you take from those bad things when they happen? How do you respond to those bad things when they happen? And we know uh, Romans says that all things work together for good to those who are uh, who, who those who love the Lord are in a call according to his purpose. And so, you know, uh, those things that are bad in our life and others will look and say, I don't know how you can go through that. Well, if your faith is strong in the Lord, he'll take the worst circumstances and he'll turn it to good. And you just have to be sensitive to listen to him and follow his leadership, listening to that still small voice. And sometimes people just face depression. They can't handle it. You know, they've been living for the Lord. They've been jealous for his name, but it's just, it's just tough. All right. So God will say sometimes to a person, go return, go back, get back to doing what I called you to do. <clears throat> and here's sometimes what he'll say. Look at 15 again, verse 15. The second part of it, he says, uh, Go return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael 
to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, of Ebel Mohila, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. He's it's three guys here. Hazael, right? You're going to prophet, you're going to uh, uh, ordain him to be the king over, uh, was it Syria? And he said, uh, you know, Jehu, Jehu, you're going to, you know, ordain to be the king over Israel. And then Elijah, Elisha, you're going to ordain to be the next prophet in your stead. All right. What is he saying? He's telling Elijah, there are people who are depending on you. You know, you need to go back. You know, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't say, hey, oh, it's just better if I'm dead. No, because there's people who are counting on you. There are people that I'm sending you to who you've got a job to take care of. And in our life, if we live our whole Christian life thinking that it's all about us, you know, we're missing the whole point. Things don't go right. We're just like, I just don't know if I can live for the Lord anymore. Well, you're thinking about yourself. But what about all those people? Like if you drop out of church, you stop living for the Lord. You got family members, maybe children, maybe, uh, you know, people in the church that are watching you and you've let all of them down. You know, you have got, you, there are other people that are depending on you. God's got a plan for you and something that he wants you to do that's going to help other people. Not only that, lost souls, lost souls are dependent on you. Now there are people that fall away and, you know, maybe along the road, they still witness here and there and they still win somebody to the Lord. It's a lot harder to do, you know, if you're in a, if you're in that state where you're not zealous for the Lord and just filled with the spirit. But I suppose it could happen. Somebody could come to you, ask the right questions, and you could lead them to the Lord. But I'm telling you, they are looking for that solid Christian who's going to be there, who they can go to, who will tell them the truth. And they don't have to see a wishy-washy person, ups and downs. Uh, you know, but you need to get back to uh, serving the Lord for the sake of other people. That it's not about us. The Christian life isn't about us, but it's about doing the work of the Lord and training up others, I believe we could get so much more accomplished and spend much less time depressed or, uh, or falling away from the Lord. <clears throat> Investing in others is going to accomplish... Here's a... Look, this, even secularly, this is to learn. Investing in others is going to accomplish way more down the road, right, than what you can do on your own. Does that make sense? So, you know, it's the whole, uh, you know, instead of giving a man a fish... Teach him how to fit, teach him how to fish so he'll never be hungry again. If you give him a fish, he'll just, you know, he'll just be full for a day and then he'll be starving again. Same principle. Our job as Christians should be to invest in other people's lives so that they can go and do the work. They can grow. They can help the work of the Lord. And the more people we get to help the work of the Lord, you know, the more that's going to get accomplished. It doesn't mean we stop. You know, I've seen people do that too. You know, the old uh, saying, work your work your way out of a job. Now here's the thing. In the business world, when somebody works themselves out of a job, it's not like they can just sit back and now they're going to retire. No. The type of person that works themselves out of a job, after that, somebody's fulfilled that job, they go on to do another job, <laughs> probably a bigger job. And then they're going to try to find somebody to replace that job. And then they're going to do another job. Meanwhile, the work is getting done in a great way. So you want that person who is willing to train up other people and invest in other people so that they can uh, carry on the work and get more accomplished. You need to be there for people to help them and to allow them to grow in advance. The third thing he says here, 1 Kings 19, look at verse 17. So he says, go and return. People are depending on you. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but this is the implication of what he says. Number three, you aren't alone. That's encouraging. Sometimes we feel like we're alone, like we're the only ones in this world serving God the way that we're serving Him or doing the things that we're doing. And the truth is you're not. Sometimes we think we're the only ones that are being persecuted. We're the only ones that have these bad things happening in our lives. You're not. <laughs> you're not. And so God tells in verse 17, look at there, it says, And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword shall Jehu, uh, shall Jehu slay, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, escape from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah slay. Verse 18 is what I was looking for. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. Now, 
7,000 doesn't sound like a whole lot compared to the thousands and thousands and thousands of the false prophets. But you know what? If you think you're the only one, all of a sudden 7,000 sounds, <laughs> sounds a whole lot, doesn't it? Uh, that's quite the advancement, you know? So, uh, uh, so he's reminding them, hey, I, you've got 7,000 men who are serving the Lord who are going through the same things that you're going through and they're serving me the same way that you're serving me. Don't give up. You're not alone. Because this was his big cry. I'm the only one left. No, you're not. No, you're not. And sometimes as an independent fundamental, and I'm talking, look, there's a lot of people that call themselves independent fundamental. I'm talking about Bible believers who love the Lord, put his word first, want to go out and do his work. They're not worried what people say about him. I'm going to tell you, that's a, that's a, a small group of Christians. You know, 30% of the world is Christian. I don't know how many is, I don't know how many would fit in this profile, maybe 7,000. <laughs> I don't think in the world there's very many people who love the Bible, want to go soul winning, want to serve the Lord, you know, uh, want to live ho holy life for Him and all that. We're talking, we're getting that list of group of Christ so called Christians down to a really small group. But you know what? It's a whole lot better than you being alone. And if you got that zeal for the Lord and you get tired sometimes, like, I just think this is too much for me, you're, you're in good company, okay? This is one re a good reason the Bible says not to forsake your, the assembling of yourselves together. You need to be around other people so you can be reminded, hey, these guys are going through the same thing I'm going through. They have the same desire and the same heart that I have for the Lord. And God will remind you to come back and to uh, keep, it, uh, keep the work going because it's not about you. It's about others. It's about mostly about giving God the glory. 1 Corinthians 10 ver uh, verse 13 says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. I think it's very interesting. Again, God, in many ways, had a right to get mad at Elijah, you know, for, for giving up on him for a minute, it seems like, you know. But he didn't. He was patient with him. Get some sleep, get something to eat. You know, get back, get back to it. And then he ends up in a cave and he's like, I just don't know. I just don't think I can go. And he said, look, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> and he showed him the something scary. You know, here's what I could do. You know, if you want to keep running from me, I could just bring down the mountains on you. I could just catch you on fire. I could. He's like, but I'm just asking you in a still small voice, go and return back to the work, you know. You're, you're, other people are depending on you. Other people are relying on you, and you're not alone. He ends up giving him Elisha, which the series is about Elijah, so I probably won't speak a whole lot about Elisha. I could preach a whole other series on him. But he ends up giving him Elisha as a servant, and, uh, and that's quite the relationship. But, you know, maybe God will give you in Elijah, Elisha in your life, you know, somebody who's there, they're with you, they're that encourager, they're that helper into your ministry. Or maybe in the Christian life, you're going to be an Elisha to somebody, you know, your, your job will be to help that other person get through those rough times, to help that person be there for them, take a little bit of the load off of, uh, off of their, uh, their life. But God does give Elijah, uh, Elisha, a servant. And, uh, and, of course, that Elisha ends up picking up where he left off. So here's a conclusion. Keep listening for that still, small voice, okay? Especially when you see the hand of God, you see the, the fire, so to speak. You see him out there, and, and there's just nothing there. You know, you, you're, not, you're not hearing from him. Well, listen for that still, small voice. It's kind of like us. Spiritual GPS, you know, <laughs> my, my GPS reroutes a lot, okay, because it tells me to turn and I miss my turn. <laughs> rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Sometimes I fear God's like that in my life. Like, hey, I told you to get off there. Okay, I'm going to get you back on track. Rerouting, rerouting, rerouting. Now go this way, right? And you go back, boy, you miss your turn again, right? Rerouting, rerouting. God will do it. He'll keep rerouting. He's got a plan for you. That plan is going to end up being good. It might not be the most direct route. <laughs> you might spend a lot of extra time trying to find the right the right road, uh, but thank the Lord He is in charge, you know. And you're not going to run out of service. I know it's kind of corny, but it's true. <laughs> He's always going to be there. He's always going to be uh, 
uh, rerouting you and getting you back on course. And here's what he's probably going to say. Go, return to the work. Others are dependent on you, and you're not alone. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> thank you for the great work that you've called us to. Help us remember that it's not our work, really. It's your work, and we're just doing it for you. Help us remember that others are dependent on us, Lord. And, and I pray that you help each of us just to stay steadfast and unmovable. Uh, help us continue on and help us grow learn from the mistakes that we make. And, uh, and in the end, Lord, help us to be like, uh, like fine gold and purified, Lord, and so that we would be uh, vessels unto honor for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.